afternoon, everybody. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. Thank you for coming out today. Uh, today I'll be talking about <coughs> the Transfer Era uh, digitization project here at CGL. So, uh, feel free to ask questions anytime you have them. Um, I don't know how long this is going to take. Maybe an hour, maybe less, depending on your questions. Uh, remember to turn on your phones, which I'm going to do right now. <laughs> and uh, a lot of familiar faces in this crowd, so I think um, what you're going to see today is some stuff you've already seen before. This is kind of a starting um, from scratch type of presentation. There have been two presentations prior to this one. Um, but we can maybe dig down into some more details because I think I've seen all your faces here before. So, um, My name is Rob Lepson. I'm the treasurer here at the library. And you all know about CGL nonprofit. Uh, genealogy Library has been here. They've been on St. Thomas for about seven, 16 years now. Um, all volunteer run, all volunteer support. Um, we do uh, a lot of genealogy, historic, history research, Virgin Islands and the entire Caribbean. And um, I'm volunteer here on Saturdays, um, one to five. When I first started volunteering here, people would come in with questions about their family, um, in particular in the Virgin Islands, because here we are. And one of the things I discovered is that there's this resource called Mara, and I didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. The first thing I heard about it was seeing pictures like this of old Danish registers, and this picture of an archivist with a bunch of Virgin Islands records and some stacks, and him looking through old register of Danish West Indies information and of course I knew this was going to be interesting stuff and I later found from Susan Lugo she had taken some of these photos she'd been up to the National Archives That's NARA is National Archives Records Administration it's the US Department and uh, this is the one most people are familiar with this is the Archives One, it's the original archives building of the United States. It's in Washington, D.C., right on the Mall. Um, it was established in 1934, and this building was completed in 1935. This is when people are going down to the Mall and they want to research some genealogy or old passenger records, they'll go here. And a lot of people think this is the front entrance, but if you're actually going to do some research, you want to go around to the back. That's where the entrance is for some of the more interesting research. So uh, that's Archives 1, and this is Archives 2 building. It was actually completed in 1993, and it is where most of the Virgin Islands records are held. A lot of the Danish records are going to be held here, and this is actually in College Park, Maryland. It's about 45 minutes away from downtown D.C. Completely separate location. It's near the college in Maryland. So they got a shuttle every hour. Yes, they have a shuttle uh, from downtown up here. It's a free shuttle. Um, it's also, a NARA app is also responsible for electronics records, and they also have 17 satellite facilities across the United States. So um, some of the US archives resources that you can get without having to go up to DC include their website, A bunch of finding aids, publications that they print, microfilms that they put out. There's information from the archives, the U.S. archives on FamilySearch and Ancestry.com, and some other publications. So here's what their website looks like. You can kind of search through it and find some stuff. Um, Record Group 55 is where the Danish records are. We'll cover that in just a second. These are some of the finding aids that are published, and we have all of these here at CGL. So you don't have to go get them, but they're online as well. And these are just guides, indexes, kind of topic level indexes to what you can find at the National Archives. These are examples of the kinds of microfilm publications that they produce. So we have several of these here at CGL, the selected um, records from the Danish West Indies in M1883. 
we have these dispatches of the consulates. I think we actually have all of these here, um, but there's several we don't have. So these are publications where the actual documents have already been microfilmed and you just have to pull out the reel and put them on the microfilm reader. And there's indexes for what's on those rolls. And on family search or ancestry, there's a lot of stuff that has been microfilmed and digitized already up there. You can get those on the computers. So there's lots of ways that you can get information without having to actually take the trip up. And um, originally we had this page set up on the CGL website as an idea, as a template for what we were going to be putting online as well. So there's lots of stuff online. That's no longer current. We have a better site. So if you can't find what you want in those resources, if you're looking for more information about the Danish West, West Indies or the Virgin Islands, then you might have to go and take the trip. And if you're interested in doing that, then I recommend going to our YouTube site taking a look at the presentation online that I gave back on October 3rd where I discussed all the steps that you'll need to consider such as the shuttle, such as getting your researcher card so that you can actually go into the archives and do the research, such as how to use those publications and finding aids to discover where all the information is located, how to actually uh, make a pull slip to get the records out of storage and all the procedures involved in keeping the records out of storage and can't, taking pictures of them, all that stuff. So all the details about actually doing the research is on this YouTube uh, video. And we have, as you can see, a bunch of other YouTube videos up there that you can watch as well. So that's all on CGL's YouTube site. So I won't get into that. We moved on. Um, but I do want to also mention something new is that the Danish archives has started their own digitization program, which many of you have probably heard about. And um, now, some of it's online. They're not advertising this so much right now. But if you go to this website, they've started their crowdsourcing project. And so they haven't officially announced that they've got a bunch of these documents digitized yet. But if you go to this site, you can actually see some of what they've accomplished already. So let's go there real quick. So there's the site to go there. It's What's the name of the site? Here. And go down. And these are all kinds of digitized documents that they've already put online. So we have census records, land lists, land registers, reports of religious congregations. Let's go to one of these. Uh, reports of religious congregations regarding births and deaths. Sorry, that one's birth, no one's deaths. And what this site is supposed to do is to make it easy for volunteers to go and help transcribe the information that's on these digitized pages. And they're saying, okay, here's a couple set of records. Here's the records from 1859 to 1876, 1878. There's 665 documents. None of them have been transcribed yet. Of these from 1879 to 1918, there's 670 documents. Volunteers have already transcribed 49 of them. So they're starting to make progress. The volunteers working on this are starting to transcribe these. And if you want to be a volunteer, they're looking for volunteers. They want you to sign up and take a look at pages and tell us what these say. So here's a list of all 650 One pages. Would it be in Danish? Some are in Danish and some are in English. And I think that's part of the problem is that a lot of the volunteers are Danish and have a hard time with the English. <laughs> So we'd actually be pretty good at helping out with this project, right? The ones that are in Danish, we can see they've transcribed, and then they've, a lot of them, they've um, translated as well. So here's the, I'm just gonna go to one of them here, but you'll get the idea pretty quickly. They take you to a site where they tell you, okay, you're on document 57 out of the 670. Here's a general idea of what this is gonna be about. Here's the image for you, digitized. And then over here, this one I guess hasn't been done yet. You gotta join the project someone had already worked on this page, they would tell you over here what these say. And they're attempting to at some point make this searchable. So all you have to do is type in your ancestor's name, give you a list of all the documents that had their name transcribed, and they take you to the document. So, great project. It's still in the works. They haven't advertised it too much yet, but it is accessible. Yeah, well, I, yeah somebody told me about this site, and I was, I, all I kept finding were indexes. I didn't find any documents. Like this one, right? Yeah, so they don't have a whole lot of documents up to date. No, they have a lot. 
I mean, and maybe it's it's obviously growing. You know, they're not just going to launch it. At, you know, they're they're kind of in a test phase right now. So. <laughs> so have fun with that. Now, our project, of course, is not funded by a big state archive, so uh, we don't have quite the technology they have. Um, but we we made an attempt at it, and so our project is doing the same thing. It's going to take it takes the documents from the archives and has digitized them so you can look at them. Okay. So the CGL digitization project um, mostly involved records from archives too, that's where most of the Danish records are. Uh, we were focused on the transfer era records, so around 1917. So those are all here. We had a Kickstarter project to help fund it. We raised just over $2,400 for that. You can still go to the Kickstarter page and see the updates and everything, and see how the project progressed. There's the team that went up, myself, David Lynch, and Paul Rude. This is just an example of a pull slip. These are what you have to fill out to pull the records out. When you pull them out, you get a bunch of stuff in boxes on a cart. Here's an example of some other kinds of boxes, some of the big registers you get. More boxes, and down here, here's a, what they call a coat box, because you could fit a suit in it. This is an example of the microfilms, that when they store microfilms, they'll put them in big cabinets like this. This is an example of one of the registers you can pull out more examples of kind of the boxes you'll get. So the records are in all kinds of shapes and forms. And when you make a pull, you don't know what you're gonna get. And all that you see is you're gonna get a box. Well, you don't know what kind of box you're gonna get. And we had some guides, but a lot of the stuff still isn't well known. So it was kind of like Christmas Day sometimes when you get a pull and you find out what's there. And this is that coat box. This is, I, I said this before, that when I opened up the coat box, I saw all these records just thrown in the coat box. Some of them were falling apart when you touched them. I just closed it back up. Someone's going to have a big project just dealing with that one box. <laughs> so uh, after four days, we captured over 45 gigabytes of data. This is a sample of some of the stuff that we have now um, digitized, and most of this is online. The website, now that it's complete, looks like this. And I need suggestions from you. It's not quite finished. I mean, it'll never be finished because the idea is to keep adding more and more to it. But um, I still don't have icons up for each of these. So if you could help me, if you go to the passports and you think of, you see something you think would be a good icon to put here for the passports, send it along to CGL and put that up there. And same for these citizenships and taxes, and same for the cemeteries. If you see a good picture that you think would make sense to put there, go ahead and send it to us. We'll put it in there. The Cemetery Commission has actual cemetery records? Or? I'll get to that in a second. Oh, okay. We're going to go through as many of these as I can. So here's the website, if you want to get here. It's relatively easy to link to now from our site anyway. And if you hadn't heard, we have a new address. All you have to do now is type in just cgl.vi. Nice and easy now, a lot easier than it used to be. And from there, you just go over to research, and then online research, and then and the, one of the first things you'll see after online research is this page. So uh, after you click one of those links for those different topic areas, it takes you to this page, which gives you a nice way to view through the documents with a slider over here. You can click up and down. A larger view of each thumbnail that you can click side to side to get to these larger views. And then if you actually want to get bigger than this, because this is kind of hard to read, you just click on this. You wait for the big image to download, because it's a lot of them are pretty large. So with our internet speeds, you may have to wait a little while. And then you get the big image, which can move around the document with the moving of the mouse. So that's how you navigate through that. Um, maybe I'll wait till the end, actually, if you want to see a demonstration of how that works. But you, you get the hang of it pretty quickly once you go to the page. That's an example of the zoom onto that same image. This is in Danish. Mm -hmm. 
So let's go through some of them. That's the point of this, is to give you guys an introduction for some of the things you can see up there. And as I was telling Ruby earlier today, I even haven't seen all these. There's just so much stuff up there that I'm still finding new things, new gems within these documents. And I think that's going to continue, especially as we reinterpret them as well. So this CGL is giving this to the community as a research, as a genealogy research and history research tool that hopefully all of you can use to help interpret this time period. So, let's go through them first. The passports issued. These are, um, they were three volumes, and they're, these are the volumes right here. And I'm pretty sure we only got through this one and this one. I don't even think we got to touch this one. And I don't know if we got both of these books fully, but I think we did get both the books, most, mostly. So there's still lots to be discovered. So this is an example of what volume one looked like. And on the front page, this is that same thing you saw earlier, it says, this protocol, or this ledger book, contains, and this is in Danish, this was interpreted for me. Um, this, this ledger book contains 301 folios authorized hereby protocol for issued passports for St. Thomas Police Chamber. So this, this is the same as the passport records we have from earlier in the um, 18th, no, 19th century. The uh, Danish West Indies archives digitized those for almost 100 years and already sent those to us on DVD. This is the same thing. The passport issues went through the police department. And um, when this says folios or files, this doesn't mean just 301 entries. I believe this means actual 301 folders worth of information because we'll see the first page itself already has almost 50 names on it. And this is a large book. So this is books of books that were rewritten from the original into this ledger is how I understand it. And so here's what it looks like. As you can see, these are all names. Okay, we're obviously got close to 75 right there. So there's lots of names in here. <laughs> um, so uh, what's at the title on each? You get a date, you get a number, the passport number. You get their name, you get where they're traveling to, you get the fee they paid, and then you get a remark. These are actually pretty easy to translate there in Danish. And it's pretty easy to see a name, and then if you see a name, of course, which you're interested in, you can then just translate that from the Danish if there's anything you can't understand. But most of it's pretty easy to understand. Um, the names especially, the where they're going to or from, look exactly the same. Kind of hard to see, huh? That gives you an idea, though, what you're going to see. And because you can, these are very high quality, if you go onto the website, you can zoom in and do them. I should also mention that when you're in that page, if you want to download any of these images, you just have to right click. And usually on, in most browsers, when you right click on the image, it gives you an option to save the image. Then you get that original large image for yourself. Um, any questions about that? The right click on the image, save the image, and then you can keep all of the ones you're interested in your own folder. So if you find a person of interest, you can keep the catalog of the ones you're interested in yourself. In. And that's the right click. Uh, so those will go from 1895 to 1921. Those are the, the passports, those three volumes. And it, it makes sense because the ones that we got from Denmark kind of ended in 1895. So I think these pick up from there. Uh, citizenship, citizenship and taxes. This one is kind of a smorgasbord of stuff. There's a couple different kinds of. of lists and registers there. I just want to go over a couple of them. One is a list of taxpayers in Christiansted in 1926. This one, when we picked it up, um, it was in a box. Um, it was in a box. It wasn't this box, actually, but one that looked just like it, or very similar to the, to the green ones, like in the bottom corner. Box 17. It just says unarranged records. So you open up the box, you have no idea what's inside, right? And this is box 17. I think these boxes go to like up to the 20s or 30s. There's stuff thrown in boxes, unarranged boxes. And we picked it up, and there, I don't have a picture, unfortunately, but it was hand wrapped blue pieces of paper. And there were lots of them. And um, David took one of them, unwrapped it, and started digitizing them. Um, I don't know what was on the others, but the ones that he got were from Christiansted in 19. 
26. Just Christian said. So it starts off with King Street. This is just a little letter on the top saying, these ones are all the tax lists for King Street. And then here it is. It's, it's basically the same as, similar to what you see in the census records, except this is 1926. And we assume that they did these every single year. So somewhere out there in the archive, maybe in one of those other boxes or in one of those other packages of blue notes, these are very small blue notes, they gave the same information for Fredericton or for St. Thomas or for 1927 or for 1925. So they're out there somewhere. Just, they give you the name of the property owner, how much it costs to rent the place, and all the people that are living there, their ages, and what they do, their occupation. And so this goes on and on and on and on. We go King Street, um, Company Street. Actually, that one's kind of interesting. Someone's been asking me about Armstrong. This is Mrs. George Armstrong. I think there was an American Armstrong lived here in St. Thomas and moved his family over there, some of his kids over to St. Croix. So I need to go back and check this one. And uh, also over here, the Christian family. And Steele. So it includes, I'm sorry, it includes like all the people in a family, because I see a whole bunch of Steels and so on. Yeah, so if this could be like a, a four family unit, four okay. family building, and this is just the owner. So the owners are the left, right. and say the tenants or whatever, Who's and the in the lids, whoever is yeah. in the house, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And the ages, so you can get a yeah. lot of information lot from of information. there. So these are nice, like most pro ta property tax or other tax lists, they fill the spaces between the census records, you know, and these ones are nice too because usually for these tax records, yeah. the, at least the matriculars only had the owners, they didn't have the occupants. So there's definitely a lot more to be done here, and this is actually one of our uh, potentials for our next visit, to go and catalog these completely. Yeah. Um, anyway, so we are at Company Street, here's Church Street, there's the Harrigan on this. It continues with Queen, Queen Street. Princess Street, Hospital, Little Hospital. Yeah, I, I can tell you, see that one up there, Diana Harrigan? That's, that's my husband's great aunt. <laughs> I can tell you right where to get this one if you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, we noticed down here, I'm not sure, a lot of them that look like the actual owner sign, but in this case, maybe not the owner. But they yeah. attest that yes, this is correct, and I pay taxes, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Okay, those are the tax lists. I wish I could spend this time on these, but I, again, could be here forever, so. <laughs> um, so I, I skipped over a couple of the ones that Mr. Caron might be interested in related to the Germans that were on island in 1917. I want to go to the applications to preserve Danish citizenship, 1918. So uh, there's a couple forms of these. This is the application itself. And I'll just read this here. On all these forms, it says, in accordance with the provisions of Article 6 of the Concession Convention, Convention of the August 1916, of the 4th August 1916, between His Majesty the King of Denmark and the United States of America concerning the cession of the island St. Thomas, St. John, St. Croix in the West Indies, the undersigned hereby declares that I want to preserve my citizenship in Denmark. So, uh, and then down at the bottom of each of these, it says, recorded in the District Court of St. Thomas and St. John, the 7th of January, 1918, and entered in protocol, LLL, page 117. It'd be nice if we could find that book. <laughs> I didn't find that book, but I found all of these, um, <clears throat> which are you know, obviously going to be the originals that then were used to enter into the protocol ledger. So here we have... Uh, this is that original sentence saying this is the person's name. They're born in St. Thomas. Date of birth, September 28, 1893. Marital status, married, gives the married date. Gives the occupation. Gives the residence. Gives the spouse's signature. I mean, that's... Residence. <laughs> <laughs> 59 West, 39 of New Life. So there's a couple examples here. 
welcome. <laughs> So anyway, these go on and on and on. <laughs> Lots of these. And similar to those are lists. So these aren't the ledgers that we're talking spoke about, but these are lists that were created. And there's three sets of these lists. These are like the official lists that were then sent over somewhere saying, here's a list of all the people who gave us their declarations. And so here's the list of declarations for St. Thomas, St. John, I have the honor to report that between the 15th of December 1917 and the 16th of January 1918, inclusive, I have received from the following persons their declarations that they decide to preserve their Danish citizenship. And it goes through several pages of St. Thomas, and then we get the same list for Christiansted, several pages of the people from Christiansted, and then another list for Frederickstead, several pages of people from Frederickstead. You can see it all the same format for each of these. Different paper, different writing. Now, I assume if these are Danish citizens, they might be leaving the Virgin Islands shortly after this. So if uh, you have someone you don't know of, you don't know where they went, what happened to them, they may not have gone to the States. They might be on this list. Cemetery Commission. Okay, so what's on these? <laughs> Again, this is uh, several different kinds of records, and the cemetery commission records, again, were just in a box of miscellaneous records. Um, there's a box. This is uh, just one, it's really hard to read this, but this is just a journal. This is actually just a small journal. It, it's very strange because it's a different format of any journal I've seen with the rest of these records from this time period. But in it, it has things like um, monthly reports of the cemetery commission. So this one, it says, during the months of July 1909, the following amounts have been received for paid burials in the Western Cemetery for account of the Colonial Treasury in St. Thomas. July 1909, we have the late Mary Ellen Schmeling, Gums, Barbel, Taylor. This is how much they paid to be buried there. And this goes every single month between 1909 goes to 1912. So here's the same thing, July 10. And for some reason, July 11, it's the only one in all of these is in Danish, <laughs> typed up in Danish. August 2011 is in English. June 2011 is in English. This is the only one in Danish for some reason. But that's what's on that link. So uh, if you're looking to find where somebody died and you can't find them anyplace else, you got a good idea they're at Western Cemetery. Now, does this necessarily mean that they died then? They might have just been paid. So I'm not sure that you can necessarily tag their date of death to these purchases. Maybe they purchased a grave ahead of time with a family first one. I'm not sure about that, but it's for someone else to research. Here are the journals. Uh, journals starting in 1890. This is a more typical of the Danish West Indies journal, a big ledger book. Here's the ledgers. And on here we have year, and this one only said 1890. This is the only one that was in the box. There might be others in similar boxes, but 1890. So it gives the date, and we have numbers along the side in 1890. We have men go here, women go here, birthplace here, age, where they lived, how they died. This is all a bunch of information about the plot, like where it is located, I think, in Western Cemetery. Um, their religion, and then remarks. And this ledger goes on and on and on. Is that just for 1890? This, this is just 1890. And this is in English? Well, uh, of the things I just, of, of the headings that you're yes. going to see, I don't think it's necessarily in English, but the name you can figure out, right? Okay. The birthplace is pretty easy to figure out. Most locations it's easy to interpret, whether in Danish or English. Yeah. The age is the number. The residence the same names, still same Danish idea. names kind of carry, right? Cause of death, no, that's going to be hard. <laughs> that's going to be in Danish, that's going to be hard. And then the religion is pretty easy to figure out as, to, as well. So yeah, it is in Danish, the remarks might be difficult, but a lot of the important information for genealogy is going to be readily available. So was the cause of death filled out for everyone? 
Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah. Um, and I want to point out this one, what I found. It's kind of interesting. We have the same guy listed twice. <laughs> yeah, so I don't think he's buried in two places. I don't think he died twice. But they're all, it's all from the same entry the same day. So they probably just duplicated. Yeah, yeah it's, it's definitely the same guy. <laughs> they just duplicated it. Um, anyway, just to show you, you know, even these records have errors. Be careful what you look at. Uh, oh, what was I going to point out here? Uh, the names, just Esperance, Drew, George, Reed, Amaro, Arniero again, Carter, Joseph Adams, so all the same names we're familiar to seeing. Moving on, correspondence to the American Consul. These are um, letters, uh, letters to, letters from the Consul and the Consul's deputy uh, prior to transfer. So while, while there was still an American Consul, before there was a U.S. government here, there was a representative of the U.S. who had been here, and Christopher Payne. Christopher Payne, yeah, there he is. So, uh, a Af prominent African American became uh, elected to the West Virginia Legislature, and his deputy was Luther Jabris Jabrinsky. Jabrinsky, right? Yeah, so you'll see letters from both of them in here. Um, I, I'd spoken about several of these before. This is a bunch of miscellaneous stuff, but one of interest, um, and you know, just in a box. <laughs> In fact, I think his box was mixed in with the educate, Department of Education stuff. I think it's box two and three in this record. What was his uh, first name? Christopher. 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 Christopher Payne. I missed the Jabrinsky's first name. Jabrinsky with last name. What was uh, his first name? First, Luther. Luther. So uh, Payne had a, a long set of letters between Hamilton and Jackson. They were. Oh, I wouldn't say friends, but I think they had a lot of, prior to transfer, Payne was trying to figure out, trying to report back to the U.S. government what was happening in the Virgin Islands, and I think Hamilton's views were accepted by Payne and then communicated further up into the states for people making decisions. So you'll see these letters here between Jackson and Payne, or Jackson and, and Jabrinsky, discussing, in, in this case, it's some labor strikes that were on St. Croix, and they were trying to figure out information. So there's lots, lots of correspondence with the U.S. government trying to figure out Okay, when we buy this, what are we buying? There's lists of property lots of times, um, and discussion about who gets the property, and should they take the property with them, or should they leave it there, as it belong to the Danes, and let the Danes take it, stuff like that. But uh, this is more historical interest. Um, well, you should add that Christopher Payne was an outstanding uh, or prominent Republican <laughs> who was appointed by uh, Teddy Roosevelt, and I think he's the first uh, black man that was ever uh, appointed as uh, uh, part of the foreign affairs or as a council. He was uh, a remarkable man, a journalist and a, a preacher. It's definitely very interesting to read his correspondence. And, and he did a lot to uh, give the information to the Navy uh, yes. about the Hamburg American Line and the sneaky stuff they were doing. So th there's definitely uh, uh, Panama telegraphs in here as well, his correspondence with the Navy and the State Department on the telegraph line. I don't have any here for you. But, um, again, these are all just mixed up. It's like there's not much order here. There's a couple of letters from Jackson, and then there's <laughs> Panama telegraph, then there's this, then there's that. So there's some stuff of interest. Occasionally, he's helping some an American do this or that in the territory. So, anyway, uh, moving on to the next set of records, the passport correspondence. And I won't go into this too much. There's lots and lots of stuff here. It, this just goes on and on. We've only just got the tip of this iceberg. Um, these are very similar to the ID cards, the 1917-18 ID cards, but these are actually the passports, like they were issuing passports. Um, so I'm not sure if some of these got out before they decided that they couldn't issue passports or someone told them not to issue passports and they started issuing ID cards instead. There's also visas in here and I'll show you, um, you know, 
we have there's several boxes. So these first set of boxes, the only ones we digitized, go up through 1922. So they're from 1917 to 1922. But there's other boxes that go all the way up into the 30s, and we didn't digitize those. So uh, this is what they look like when you open up a box. There, each of these is a different set. Some of them is correspondence, some of them the applications, some of them the actual passports issued, and they go year by year. And then the next box will have the next set of those records. So there's at least four or five boxes of these up there, and we only did the first one. And so this is the you know wonderful information you get when you look at those applications, similar to the ID cards. Um, when someone wanted to get that passport or ID card, they had to submit all the supporting document, and all those documents are still here, mm -hmm. just filed away. They never got, some people might have got the stuff back, but a lot of people obviously didn't. It's still in these files. So these are not just those passports, they're all the supporting information. Some original birth certificates are in here. So um, you get all the vital information. The name's not on this page for this woman. In some cases it is. These are the uh, more identity cards. I'll just take a note on this one. This one is from 1919. This is number one, well, it says agent number 150, so it may or may not be ID card number 150. Um, but if you take a look at number 150 on the set that David Knight prepared, she's, she's not on there. So it's possible that they started renumbering every year so that the list goes up to 360 for 1917, might start over again for 1918, might start over again for 1919. I'm not sure. I mean, I don't know if anybody really understands what was going on with passports and ID cards back then, but here's a whole bunch of new information to start to figure it out, and we know where to find it now. Um, and on top of that, there's additional in other places online, you'll see where there's the correspondence going back and forth between Secretary of State and the local agents trying to figure out, you know, and, and passing back and forth protocols and policies saying, this is why you can't issue a passport. This is why we need to start issuing ID cards instead. Do you need help? Uh, yeah, granted permission <laughs> under the Act of 1918 to travel between St. Thomas and Antigua. Oh, sure, travel. On or about February 11, 1919, she'll return. She produced a birth certificate to prove that she was Virgin Islands citizen. Okay. And these are all. Um, she was born on St. Thomas. Born on St. Thomas. Thomas. Father's from St. Croix. Mother's from Virgin Islands. She's 15 years old, five foot one, black, uh, black eyes, round chin, black hair, dark complexion. Um, she wants to travel to attend school. school. Here, right? Secretary of State said that we had to start issuing ID cards, right? So, uh, what's the real difference? I mean, basically, they're both travel documents, right? They're what you needed to travel. So, if in 1918, my understanding is they weren't citizens. If the, if they weren't Danish citizens, they weren't citizens of anywhere because citizenship wasn't granted until 1927. So, I don't think you can issue a passport to somebody that's not a citizen. That would be my understanding. That's why they, the Secretary of State would be involved and um, they would have to issue an ID card instead of a passport because they ain't citizens. But it, if you look through some of these records, it's obvious someone here who was used to writing Danish passports started writing U.S. passports. <laughs> 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 and so yeah, it's like, oh, no, no, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Probably got a nice fee for that. <laughs> I, let me talk about this one real quick. This yes. is Benjamin Oliver <laughs> and his wife, Maud. Maud. And um, this is a passport to travel between June of 1919, uh, Ju June 1919, to December 19. I'm sorry, June 1920 to December of 1920. It says he's a school teacher. He's, he was born in Montserrat, hmm. and uh, he's going on vacation. 
But you know what's interesting? Because I, I have looked at that record up there in the archives. She lost her citizenship because she was married to somebody who wasn't a citizen. I have a document that says that. And he's not a citizen because he, he wasn't born here. Because he house. wasn't born here. But where was she born? <laughs> she was born here. But because but she, she was married to somebody who wasn't a citizen, she lost her citizenship. Her citizenship. Wow. I have copies of a document I gave them to. to um, so she was, a, she, she was a Danish, she was a Danish citizen. Mm -hmm. she, she was a Danish her. citizen. The, the 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 passport document I looked at was in the U.S. time. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. But because she was married to him, she, she couldn't. Lost her US she lost her U.S. citizenship. Okay. Yes. okay. Because there, so you know, the woman had no rights. Right. Yeah. yeah. This is a linguist and accountant for the born and sons. What I like about this. Barely see if he's got these little Nez Perce glasses. glasses yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's uh, from Philadelphia. And what I was interesting about him, it says he's the captain of the New York police, which I thought was interesting. Uh, yeah, from the U.S., but just traveling through. And his parents, though, are born in Brazil and England. So I was wondering if he was just passing through and needed to have something to move on because he knew he was going to be coming back. But this is obviously St. Thomas is the point going to South America, he'd stop through. Mm. Anyway, he, did, he didn't seem like he had a lot of ties to the Virgin Islands. <laughs> and this is Turbe uh, from St. Bart's, French citizen. This is a visa. But I, I think he's headed back to St. Bart's. On a boat. I don't know much about Turbays and St. Bart's, if this was one of the originals or one of the ones who had been here a while. I figured someone would be interested in seeing this. So moving on. Um, <coughs> everything you've seen so far and everything you're going to see after this one are all from Archives 2 in College Park. This is the only set. This, this one and this one and I think this one. These are the only ones that are actually from Archive 1 right downtown. These are Navy records. So I don't know why they keep the Navy records downtown. I think it's because all the people that go look for crazy Navy military stuff that they think they're going to find top secret stuff, they want it to be downtown. And I saw a lot of crazy people looking for Navy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> You'll see that in Archive 2 as well. Because <laughs> there's, in Archive 2, there's what they call military and civilian. Uh, civilian. And because there's a lot of people looking for records related to military. So they give them their own section, and all genealogists go over the civil section. So you see that in both places. Anyway, what's interesting here is that, of course, because after the transfer, the Navy ran the island for many years, the naval records are kind of important, and not many people know that. So here they are, and you know where to go find them. Um, both of these are indexes. They're microfilms that give indexes to additional information. So the, both of these, the, those two, M1052 and M1067, they're not available online, even though they're microfilms, it's crazy. You'd think it'd be pretty easy to digitize them. But So we went and took pictures, and Mary can tell you he's done it as well. And it's just subject listing. So you go to the subject listing, you get the microfilm that says V for Virgin Islands. You go to Virgin Islands, and right after V, H comes VI. And then there's you know, one and a half films of Virgin Islands references referencing Navy activities in the Virgin Islands. So that's it's really interesting. I recommend taking a look through it. None of the actual documents are there, but the subject headings are there. So you might find subjects of interest that you would then want to go pull the original documents. That's going to make it a lot easier because you can study that ahead of time before you get there. One of the actual pulls I did, though, was this Group 45, Entry 517. These are actual um, correspondence. So all these boxes are filled with naval correspondence in the Caribbean region in which Virgin Islands was a part. And this one box is correspondence for about the first three months of 1917. So I'm not going to show you too many of these, but they're, um, <coughs> this is what they look like. They're just like signal communications that have been interpreted and typed out for someone to read. And this one I think is pretty interesting. It says, um, from the Secretary of Naval, Navy, so from you know, headquarters in the Pentagon to cruiser force. So there's obviously all these like Sig signal word, secret code words that they're using. I think cruiser <laughs> force is one. It's like, we don't know who is supposed to be getting it. It's just cruiser force. Um, but it says, plans have been made to take possession on April 16th, 
of the Danish West Indies. April 16th. The date has necessarily been advanced to March 31st. The Dolphin, that's the name of the vessel, will carry, will, will arrive at St. Thomas about April 8th with permanent naval governor on board. The vessel, it says Vestal, the vessel accompanied by the flag, will immediately proceed to via Santo Domingo City to St. Thomas. At Santo, Santo Domingo City, the vessel will receive as many Marines as can be spared until arrival of their reliefs about April 10th. Later possession of the islands on March 31st. Acknowledge one couple of tokens. So my guess is that they knew they were going to declare war before April 16th. They needed to push up the transfer. <laughs> so last minute correspondence. And there's a lot of good correspondence in this area. So that's, that's it for that. Some good reading. Uh, so this is the last set here. I've got a couple more to go through, then we'll wrap it up. Um, repatriation and nationality is very similar to the other page of random citizenship and immigration records. I won't go through that too much just to show you some of what's in there. Um, a lot of these are just correspondence back and forth, some proof documents saying, I'm a citizen, I need to come home. I'm a sailor, I got stuck here, can you help me get home? Please send some money for me. Um, things like that. But it, it deals with people and travel. So if you think someone was a seaman or traveling around, it might be a good place to look if you're at a brick wall. Department of Education. Um, these are just a box of stuff. <laughs> Very disorganized. Um, two sets of groups because I found it. Two sets of boxes. So these boxes, again, again, you open it up and it's all mixed up. But most of the stuff was um, from the desk of um, the director of education right after transfer. His name was Daniel Nays. Does anybody know that name? And I wondered about that because it, it, it seems to be pretty prominent here at this time in education. Maybe it just yeah, didn't last please. long. <laughs> um, How does so, it spell? N-A-S-E. Yeah. So it's uh, various documents. Um, We've got lists of children attending private schools. There are lists of grades. Like, I don't know why <laughs> the students, a whole set of grades for students on their finals is up in the National Archives, but it is. There are applications for teachers to come work in the Department of Education, Virgin Islands. There are lots of lists of students who haven't been attending school, even though they're of age. There's actually a list of them, of nays to the parents saying, your student must be coming to school. Um, so more lists of students, lists of students at the convent school, <coughs> Carl Andrews at convent, gives where they live. This is an application to be a teacher from uh, Charles Reynolds, notice he's from Ohio, mm. and, and for some reason Dr. Nays wanted all of them to send their pictures in, so there's lots of pictures of teachers here. I don't know how many of them became teachers and how many didn't. Letters are going back and forth. There's also payroll lists of the teachers from this time period. What was the salary? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Same as now. Low. <laughs> 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 um, and then miscellaneous records. A lot of these are ones we've had up on the site since our, our initial project. A lot of the same stuff. Um, I think this one, correspondence regarding immigration, that might be a new one. You know, these marriage applications is definitely new. There's not many there. It's it's strange. There's just a couple here and there marriage applications from that time period. It's obviously not a complete set. Maybe they were special for some reason. Got pulled, taken out. Again, once you start digging around, again here's the website, and we will continue to add more as we get time. But there's still a lot of stuff I haven't gone through the processing yet. Um, which takes a little bit of work. Um, in particular, there's uh, newspapers. We have Lightborn, we have the Bulletin, and the Emancipator for two or three years for each of those in the transfer era. And there's usually not a lot of stuff in there, but every once in a while you'll find really interesting stuff in there. Um, there is additional consular correspondence with, with France and England on the, for those consuls. There's additional, additional immigration travel records that wasn't as easy to put up a whole bunch of them. 
kind of miscellaneous records, so we'll get those up eventually. There's also poor commission records, which, um, kind of like cemetery commission, monthly requests for funding for whatever reason, and I've been advised not to put those online. Uh, so yeah, there's more to come. And again, remember, if you've got an idea for an icon to put up here, please send it along, because we want the site to look a little bit better. So we'll let you know when more stuff comes out, and uh, happy hunting. We, we hope you can all spread the word and, and use these documents to create interesting dialogue and interesting research. And share with us and come and do a presentation like this and tell us what you found out. And um, thank you for attending. Thank you. Thank you. And you're welcome to stay the rest of the day if you want to go online and start a search. Any questions? <laughs> Do you remember like about how much the cemetery, the burial fees were? Like what were people paying for that? Yeah, those fees they said like twenty five. I think twenty five dollars? Which yeah. seems super high. So, so who owned like, the cemetery? It was government cemetery. Oh, government cemetery? Well, it was it's Western like, Cemetery? Western Cemetery was a government. Uh, yeah, all, all those, the Cemetery Commission was Western Cemetery. And you, you said that they've got information about the plot, right? It looks that way. <laughs> yeah, because I know they used to, to do a measurement <coughs> to tell you so many feet west and east or whatever, you know, yeah. to, to, to identify the spot. It looked that way. But then they changed, somewhere along the line, they changed the direction that they were using for the measurements. And so they, you know, might show you the wrong, <laughs> wrong grave now using whatever they currently do. Here's where you find it. Uh, it was this one. Um, it has to load all the thumbnails oh, first, yeah. so that's be patient. It has to load all the thumbnails in. So in, in records that have a whole lot of records, if pages have a whole lot of records, and all those thumbnails can take some. downloading the big image. Now, if I right-clicked here, it would download the medium-sized image. Mm -hmm. But after it downloads the large image, then I right-click on the large image, then it'll download the full-size, high-quality image. They're pretty big. days during the week and then on the fourth day on Saturday they're open but you can't request any new pulls so on Friday we pulled two carts and set them aside those are most of the newspapers and then digitize the newspapers on Saturdays. One of the things that I notice about um, some of those documents that I've seen online they don't indicate race. Well many do. <laughs> well, what many do. Race. It depends on the document. It depends on like okay, so what doc like what document would uh, indicate race? Well, like the census records, they changed what they're enumerating every ten, every time they did it. So some years. Wait, they, even wait, even Danish. Okay, because I know that U.S. census. U.S. too. Yeah. Because like with passport and uh, passport thing. applications, they didn't ask what race, but I guess. Some of them did. The one that you put up there. Okay. Yeah, the. The uh, one, the one example he showed, I think it did. Okay. Yeah, some of them. Eye color, hair color. No, it said uh, skin color. No, it said. Dark, yeah, had her complexion and mm -hmm. shape. Yeah, that's yeah, but you can be a dark white. How <laughs> picture was there? So th these are the. This is the information about the the grave. And. Okay, no, it's so yeah. Twenty eight feet, like twenty eight feet by forty feet, maybe, or twenty eight feet from this place to that place. Um, I'm not exactly sure. Right. These. I recall these changed. A little bit. This one B and C and probably F. So they're obviously referring to some place in the cemetery. Mm -hmm. And I think those letters are pretty, 
that's how they use it to separate the sections in by the letters. Right? By the letters, and then like once I was looking for for a grave of my, my godson, he died when he was nine, and I kind of thought I knew where the grave was, right? But I hadn't been there in a long time, and of course there were more graves around. And when I went to try to find it, they gave me, you know, the coordinates, and the grave that they took me to was uh, an adult. I said, no, this is not the person, right? It turned out they had changed the way they were doing their measurements, and when the guy reversed it, I found it. So, you know, you have to be really careful with that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Because they showed me an old grave of, a, of an adult, and I said, no, that's not, that's not him. And eventually I found it, you know. So I don't know what they're doing right now, and how often they change those coordinates, you know. But anyway. So, I, just to show you again, if you want to download this, if you saw someone over here that you were interested in, the men, here's the women. So if you're interested in her. So if you want this whole page high resolution, you right click on it and save the picture. Mm, okay. At least on my screen, it allows me to save it. Wow. So you save and then you can print it? And then you'll get a, a little thing saying it's downloading down here. Mm -hmm. and then, yeah, you can print it, you can email it, you can post it online if you want. But that's how to get them. And if you want the whole set, um, you can always come up here. I mean, we don't keep anything private. Um, you can actually see the entire archive here. You can go right to all the images here. So if you want to download 45 gigabytes of data, you can go right here. <laughs> you can put it where? <laughs> and you, know, you can go there directly to grab the set of images if you want. And that might be easier depending on the kind of work you're doing. So we're not trying to keep this private right now. We want people to use it. <laughs> That's right. Dr. So, Crone. Crone? Yes. So what you did was to take a camera, yeah. take photos of all of these right. records, right. and then take the little cartridge out and put it into a computer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. How much assistance do they give you when you're up there? Do they just pull the forms for you and you're on your own? That's, that kind of came up before as well, that um, if I was to go up again next time, I, there's specific records I want to get and I would tell them exactly what I'm looking for because I think those might require some of their assistance. But like for translations and stuff or anything? Like no, because uh, there might be in a location that it's hard to find or that they're fragile and I want a whole bunch of the fragile ones. Or, but, um, Generally, nobody there knows a lot about this set of records. So in terms of helping you, they're not going to help you too much. They're just there to follow your instructions of what to pull, go look for it, and give it to you. And But we know that sometimes where they say it's supposed to be, it's not there. You might have to push them. And if you keep pushing and being friendly, they'll maybe find it for you if but it's there. There's an app that can translate even foreign languages on pictures. Uh, what the app is, I don't know, and I haven't tried to use it yet. But it doesn't work so well on these because these aren't in the format of, of text. Uh, it's okay. the script. And oh yeah. Those okay. apps usually don't work on the script. Okay. So what you have to do is take the script in Danish, punch those into the apps or Google Translate or whatever Applefish you want to use. Yeah. And we have the dictionaries here as well. I mean. Newspapers that you found, um, were they specific to 1917? Or? We only looked at the night. We tried to find the 1917, 18 ones. I think the Emancipator was 22. That was the first one they had up there. And they had the whole set from 22. Yeah, so you'll be uploading that soon. If you really <laughs> want it, I can give it to you. Um, if you don't want to wait, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but that, those will be easy, but they're, again, they're just not as interesting ge genealogically um, because of newspapers, you know, especially Lightborn Mail Notes and uh, Bolton. There's maybe like one column in each week's edition that's of any interest at all. The rest of it's a bunch of ads you know, and the same old stuff. So it's not a high priority to publish. But yeah, it'll get up there soon. I can definitely give you a message. If you tell me why you want to see it. <laughs> I did find that one the most interesting.
So do you have any plans to continue to go back? Yes, I, I want to go back in May 17th. But anybody who wants to go up ahead of time, I'm certainly happy to sit down and share notes about how to make the most productive use of your time up there. Did you work around the clock? Or as much as you can. Until they, until they throw you out, right? Nine <laughs> to five. <laughs> yeah. So when they pull a box of books for you, a box of documents, do you have a certain time you have to return it? Do they limit you? you uh, I think they'll let you keep it for maybe two weeks. I could be wrong. But um, you can only two, pull two of those cards, no, maybe it's three of those cards at once. I think they let you put one on reserve and actually have two out with you, but that's it. You can't just pull six cards, you know. Okay. So they limit how much you can have at once. Mm -hmm. yeah, as I, I said in the other the, the other presentation, like the worst thing is when you make a pull and they come out and they give you a big cart but it's only got one box on it because something was wrong with all the other pulls. Mm -hmm. and the best thing is when you make a pull and it comes out completely full and they say, and here's the others, you know, you have to save those for your next pull and you can send those in right away and put those on the second cart. So definitely maximizing your time while the library is while the archive is open, and what you can get on those carts. Because just because you got all those boxes doesn't mean there's interesting stuff in them either. You know, then you have to actually look through them all and use the time looking through them and getting ready for the next pull, which is only an hour away, maybe even less because you make you put a pull in at 10 o'clock. The stuff might not come out until 10:30. Then you got to make another pull by 11 o'clock. What are you going to do? Look at the stuff or make you know research what you want to pull next. So that's why it's nice to have a couple people up there at the same time because you also got to be taking pictures too. That's right. It'd be nice to live up there. <laughs> Just for that. <laughs> so you're watching you, when you pull the documents when you get the documents. They have a designated room where you sit and photograph them. Well, most of the rooms actually is the reading room. The reading room itself is huge. They have a little copy area and the photographing area where we work, but then there's also just a bunch of tables. Big room, a bunch of tables. And uh, the actual place we're doing the research is just uh, a room, maybe a little bit bigger than this, where people are pulling out the, the guides and putting the full slips. But most of the space at Archives 2, at least, is on tables with people who have cards next to them looking through the documents they pulled. Yeah, so it's it's National Archives, the United States, so you have all sorts of research, historical research taking place. You know, not everybody's up there digitizing stuff. They, you know, for a lot of the American records, it's a little bit easier to figure out where the stuff is. You know, they, it's not as old. They didn't just throw it all in a box. <laughs> right. So they have a better idea where it is. They don't have to worry so much. You know, a lot of people maybe live up there. You know, they're from D.C. and doing research. Mm -hmm. Bye. Do you think that with the work you're doing, We'll get to the point where we can have somebody dedicated to working on our records up in the archives. I mean, you know, we're going to lose a lot of those documents. I've, I've gone through documents, and by the time I'm done, I've got little pieces of paper all over me and all over the floor and everything, you know. Um, I don't know what effort we need to make to have a, a dedicated person to, to pay really pay attention to our records. Yeah, I know. I worked with a former delegate trying to, you know, see what she could do to, you know, have us have a person. But uh, yeah. I'm just thinking now that because some things will be online and maybe more people will be interested and, in, you know, I don't know. That was certainly our goal for this project, was yeah. to see what we could do to increase the access. Before we move all that stuff. Exactly. Well, like, to digitize it so we didn't have to always put our hands on it. Mm -hmm. But obviously yeah. there's a lot of organization so, a lot of stuff. So problems yeah. with how it's stored that mm -hmm. is the first hurdle. Yeah. Well, thank you for your questions. Okay. Have a good weekend. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. And if you're not a member, please consider joining. Amy will be at the back desk with your membership. Spread the word.